what up Cavs Nation? I'm your host Ethan Sands and I'm back with another episode of the Wine and Gold Talk podcast. I'm joined by your favorite beat reporter, Chris Fedor. What up, Chris? Ethan, what's going on, man? How are you? Enjoying this hectic day that is NBA basketball mixed in with the NCAA women's tournament coming to a conclusion. I think I've been watching basketball for like eight hours now. Hey, it's not a bad thing. Not at all. Not at all. But Chris, before we get into all the hecticness that was today, I need to talk to you about one thing that may be more important than everything else going on. Chris, did you have in and out since we have last <laughs> talked? No, I was going to have it tonight, actually, to cap off my road trip, but I decided to get some Italian at a really, really good spot. So as much as I was planning on a second trip to In-N-Out, the timing just never worked itself out. And, and cravings are cravings. And when I crave Italian, I go find Italian. And it was delicious. So you've been on the West Coast. Let's say, let's just say L.A. for like the last three, four days. Do you have a top food spot that you went to since you've been in Los Angeles? Oh, yeah. I mean, anywhere I go, Ethan, this is the thing that you'll start to learn about me. Whether it's Los Angeles, Toronto, Atlanta, Orlando, every single spot on the road, every place that the Cavs go, I have a go-to spot. I make sure that I frequent that place specifically. And it depends when I come to Los Angeles where I'm going to stay. Am I going to stay in Manhattan Beach? Am I going to stay downtown? Am I going to stay in Santa Monica, Marina Del Rey? So this time I stayed in Marina Del Rey. When the Cavs have a long trip in L.A. and they have multiple days here in L.A., I usually like to stay by the beach. I usually like to stay in a location that I'm pretty familiar with. So I would say during my time covering the Cavs, I've stayed in Marina Del Rey most frequently, so I have a good grasp on restaurants around here, things to do around here, where to run, where to walk, all that kind of stuff. And there are two places in Marina Del Rey that I absolutely love. One of them is kind of like an all-American steakhouse, and you know me, I'm meat and potatoes guy. Through and through, anytime I can get a good steak, I will uh, definitely try and take advantage of that. So last night, I went to a place called Charcoal Venice. It is fantastic. It did not disappoint. It was just as good as I remember. I went there last year. I went there the year before, and I tried to, to stop at Charcoal Venice every single time I'm in the L.A. area. So that was one of them. And the other one was a couple of nights ago... I found a place, an Italian spot called, and I'm probably going to butcher the name of this because it's all spelled weird. It's U-O-V-O, and I believe it's pronounced Yovo, which means egg in Italian, I believe. At least that's kind of what the vibe I was getting by being in there. And they are a restaurant in, in the Marina del Rey area, Ethan, that imports their pasta from Italy every single day. So it is so fresh, it is so good, you sit around a bar amongst a bunch of strangers, kind of family style, that table set up, and all of the chefs are cooking the pasta basically right in front of you. And if you have multiple people that go with you, there is like a tasting menu that you can do, and you can do five different things from the tasting menu. Now, it was only me, I was by myself, so I just ordered off the menu, I got some bolognese. It is probably the best Italian that I've ever had in my entire life. So that is going to be, I I just found it this trip. I never had heard about it before. I did some research before I got to the Los Angeles area and I went to Yovo. And from now on, every time I come to this area, I am going to make at least one stop there. And if I didn't think it was going to be super busy tonight on a Sunday, and if they took reservations, which they don't, I probably would have gone there again to cap the trip, but I was in a little bit of a time crunch, and I decided to go somewhere else in Santa Monica instead. But Yovo, it is one of my top restaurants now across the beat. That is some high, high praise from a guy that travels a lot. Right. 
That's Shout out to them. Good to hear that you actually have enjoyed the food scene and been able to find new places that you can travel to. But Chris, I think it's about that time that we get over to basketball and talk about what happened today and especially of how it affected the Cavs. So first, we have to start with the Cavs game itself. Cleveland Cavaliers, Los Angeles Clippers, Cavs trying to avoid going on a three-game losing streak, which they are now going on after a 120-118 to 118 loss to the Clippers. It was a game where the Cavs had a 26-point lead at one point in the game and had multiple 20-point leads throughout the game and still allowed the Clippers to come back and win on a last-second game winner by... Paul George on an ankle breaker against Evan Mobley. It was disgusting. And Chris, I just want to get your sense of what happened in this game. Because it was not back and forth until like the very end. It seemed like you might have had your story written by halftime. But knowing you, it was like, hey, well, things change in the NBA. So probably not. But This was a game that felt like it was out of reach for the Clippers up until one point. So what was your thought process on what was the major change that the Clippers made to, quite honestly, stifle the offense of the Cleveland Cavaliers who scored 40 points in the first two quarters and were held to 38 points in the entire second half? The Clippers definitely deserve credit, and and Coach Ty Lue definitely deserves credit. He is a great coach. He is willing to take chances, even if it seems out of the ordinary. He went away from James Harden completely in the second half, especially in the fourth quarter, and he stuck with a lineup of Amir Coffey, Russell Westbrook, Norm Powell. He went away from Avika Zubats. So a couple of his starters, P.J. Tucker, three of his starters he went away from because he found a lineup that was working against the Cavs both offensively and defensively. And in the first half, the Cavs were taking advantage of getting out in transition, pushing the pace, playing fast. And a big part of that was because they were attacking P.J. Tucker, they were attacking James Harden, and I think Ty noticed that for the Clippers, and he made a lineup change, especially in that fourth quarter, and I think that was part of it. I think that was certainly part of it, because the lineup that he went to had much more success defending the Cavs, slowing down the Cavs' offense, which was sizzling in the first half, um, and creating their own advantages on the offensive end of the floor. So kudos to Ty for going away from James Harden. It's James Harden, right? That's one of the most important players that the Clippers have. Did not play him a minute in the fourth quarter. P.J. Tucker didn't see the court in the fourth quarter. Avika Zubak was in there for the final inbound, and, and that was it. That was the first thing that happened. Beyond that, this was also self inflicted when it came to the Cavs. A lot of the things that they were doing in the first half of the game that were so successful on the offensive end, Ethan, they scored 80 points in the first half. That is the most points that they have scored in any half at any point this season. And there was ball movement. There was an inside-outside game. There was an aggressiveness. There was an attack-mindedness from Darius Garland and Karis LeVert. They played with a great pace in the first half. Statistically, their pace number was 109 in the first half. They were relentless in terms of making quick decisions, in terms of getting into their offense quickly, in terms of getting out into transition. So a 109 pace in the first half for the Cavs. You want to know what their pace was in the second half? How about 91 which is just a disaster. They played too slow. They got away from some of the things that were working so well for them in the first half. The ball got a little bit sticky. The decisions didn't come as quick. And it was just as good as the Cavs played in the first half. It was that level of bad in the second half for this team. And it's kind of been the story of the second half of the season. It has been an inconsistent second half. And that means quarter to quarter. That means half to half, that means game to game, that means week to week, day to day, month to month. They just haven't found a level of consistency that they showed 
at the beginning of the season. And teams are going to make runs in the NBA. The Clippers are a very, very good team. They're a capable team. So if the Cavs don't keep up their level of play that they showed in the first half or something close to that, they're going to be vulnerable to a run or two or three. They're going to be vulnerable to a comeback against one of the Western Conference's elite. And Paul George went nuclear in the fourth quarter. He outscored the Cavs all by himself. Yeah, Chris, I mean, you mentioned it. This offense was going insane in the first half. It was a time that we have not seen from this Cavs team as of late, especially when we talk about getting off to quick starts. And Chris, you mentioned it, the James Harden defense in transition, he had picked up three early fouls and just simply was not defending in transition. It was allowing for the Cavs to get open baskets and just attack the rim because everybody that was behind James Harden and trying to get back on the same possession just simply couldn't catch up to the speed and quickness that the Cavs had. It was a great offensive set that they were running and being able to push the pace. But like you said, Ty Lue making the adjustments that were needed to take James Harden out, that's really where I saw the difference as well in the second half. But Chris, the loss to the Clippers not only bumped the Cavs down to fifth place, remember this, that they were in third to start the day. They are now in fifth place in the Eastern Conference standings and not tied for fourth, fifth, or whatever. They are a half game behind the Orlando Magic and the New York Knicks, who occupy the third and the fourth seed in the Eastern Conference. After Orlando and New York won games today, New York even took down the Milwaukee Bucks. This Eastern Conference is so crazy right now, Chris. You see everything has the opportunity to change, and there's three games left for the Cavs at least. The Cavs have two games that are supposed cakewalks, and then they play the Indiana Pacers in between them. I had said on an earlier podcast that I believe that this team could either finish with 48 wins or 49 wins this season, depending on if they beat the Indiana Pacers or not. But Chris, we had also talked about them potentially reaching 50 wins. They can no longer do that this season, which is not a step in the wrong direction, but a goal that they had set that they are simply not going to reach. I wanted to talk about what you took away from today's game and how they could match up in different playoff matchups, Chris, because right now they have a date with the New York Knicks traveling to New York if the game, if the playoffs would have started today. I know that the Knicks are a bad matchup for the Cavs, but without Julius Randle and Mitchell Robinson currently not in their starting lineup, it would be an interesting matchup for me. I know we've talked about them being the worst matchup. I said this on one of the solo podcasts that I did last week, that I think Miami is now the worst matchup possible for a first round with the Cavs. But What do you think, Chris, and what seeding do you think right now would actually be the best for the Cavs to get? I'm stuck between the sixth seed and the second seed. They're not getting the second seed. We can stop that. I mean, we talked about this about a month ago when they were going into this stretch, and I said it was much more likely for the Cavs to get all the way down to five than it was for them to creep all the way up to two because you have to talk about the state of the team. You have to talk about the team as it was constructed and all the things that the Cavs were dealing with and the schedule ahead and all that kind of stuff. I just don't see two as a realistic possibility. And I know the Bucs have struggled down the stretch, but the Bucs and the Magic are going to play each other a couple of times here. And, you know, I just, I just don't think there's a logical pathway for the Cavs getting the two seed, especially given the way that they're playing. I I think the bottom line is this, Ethan. This is not a good basketball team right now. It's not. And that doesn't mean that they're going to be a bad basketball team going into the playoffs. It doesn't mean that they're going to be a bad basketball team in the first round. There's still time for them to work through some things. There's time for guys to heal up and get closer to 100%. But it just feels like the way that the Cavs have played down the stretch of this season, when we're talking about the last couple of weeks of March and the first week of April, it just feels like a broken, defeated team. I don't know how they're going to recover from this stretch. It feels like the kind of stretch that 
completely derails a season. Again, that there is time for them to change that and, and prove me wrong on that. But I just, there was bad vibes in the locker room following tonight's game against the Clippers. And I think rightfully so. There was a lot of disappointment. There was a lot of dejection. There were bad vibes in the locker room following the Denver game when Donovan Mitchell was angry, when he was frustrated. I just don't think winning a couple of games down the stretch against Memphis and Charlotte, maybe if they beat Indiana too, I I just don't think that that is going to be some kind of like magic elixir or some cure-all that's going to make the Cavs feel better about the way that they're playing the way that they've come together going into the postseason. It's just a a really inconsistent, bad team that if the playoffs were to start tomorrow, I don't know how anybody, including people inside the organization, could have a whole bunch of confidence that the Cavs are going to get out of the first round. They got to play better. They got to figure some things out. Plain and simple. Plain and simple, Chris. I really don't think we've said on this podcast that there was a high chance that the Cavs make it out of the first round, especially after the All-Star break. They just haven't played like a team that are ready and are capable of going on a seven-game series against a team that has been successful this season and is going in the right direction. The only team that's having a spiral like the Cavs are right now in the Eastern Conference is the Milwaukee Bucks. They're on a four-game losing streak. They lost to the Knicks today. They lost to the Raptors, the Grizzlies, and the Wizards this month. They haven't gotten a win this month, and they only have four games left as well. So, yes, it's difficult to get the second seed. Maybe I should have said third seed. That probably is more realistic, but still a challenge for this Cavs team to do. But what I really want to look at is where people are sitting in the standings, Chris, and what could possibly happen. Because I know we talked about basketball reference having a .02% chance at one point to get for the Cavs to go all the way down to the play-in tournament. Do you still have that pulled up? Do you know what that percentage is looking like now? Keep in mind, the Cavs play, they play Memphis and they play Charlotte toward the end of the season. So, and they're both at home. So, you know, those are figurative layups at this point in time. And that's really, really helpful for the Cavs in terms of avoiding the play in tournament or avoiding any further than a drop from number five, which is where they're currently at right now. So according to... Basketball reference, the playoff probabilities report, the Cavs now have a 2.4% chance of dropping to the play-in. They have a 97.6% chance of being 1 through 6. Obviously, 1 is not happening, but just like that's how they have it broken down. Correct. Also, I want to point out that Milwaukee, even though they've struggled and lost four straight games, have clinched a playoff seat. They're not going to be in the play-in. They're going to have an automatic bid. And they did that today, I believe, even in their loss when Orlando or New York won. So those things are crucial and critical to keep in mind going forward. But, Chris, I mean, Indiana's been playing well as of late. The 76ers, even without Joel Embiid, Tyrese Maxey had 50 points today. And the Miami Heat went down against the Pacers, but they still are the Miami Heat. These are all teams that are difficult. They are all teams that have shown that they have the capability to win, especially against the Cavs this season. The Cavs have not swept the series against any of these teams. It is going to come down to coaching and rotations and things of that nature. And I know the Clippers are tough and are long and things of that nature, but I've seen a lot of discourse about fans being upset with Sam Merrill not getting playing time. And I wanted just to touch on that. Here we go. And I just wanted to touch on it again because I I wanted people to remember that Sam Merrill struggles in those different sets against teams that are defensive-minded, those teams that are strong and long and have a guy that are willing to just go and stay with Sam the entire time. So him getting six minutes, only taking one shot, is not indicative of his play and not indicative of what this team thinks of or his relationship with J.U. Bickerstaff because that's what I've been seeing. I've seen that a lot of people are like, does J.U. Bickerstaff hate Sam Merrill? No. 
That's not the case. He's trying to make it so Sam can be successful and that so you guys don't hate him when he doesn't have a decent performance against a team that is ready for him. And that's what we've seen a lot of. Like some people have said that he's just disappeared during games, but those are against different opponents that he tr- has trouble with. But here's the other thing, Ethan. Like, no kidding, he disappears throughout the course of games or stretches through the season. He's the 11th guy in this rotation. Like, why don't people understand that? Not everybody's Donovan Mitchell. Not everybody is Darius Garland. Not everybody is Evan Mobley and Jared Allen, where their minutes are basically secure, where they're matchup proof, where they've earned that kind of leash. Like, not everybody is going to be handled the same kind of way as those important players. When you're the 10th or 11th guy in the rotation, it's going to be based on matchups. It's going to be based on feel. Some nights you're going to play 30 minutes against the Utah Jazz. Other nights you're going to play five or six. That's life in terms of being at the back end of an established rotation. And by the way, the other thing that played into Sam Merrill getting six minutes, and I think it's important to point out they played seven minutes against the Clippers earlier this year too. So it's obviously a matchup that, that J.B. Bickerstaff does not like for Sam. But Isaac Okoro was back from a four-game absence because of a toe issue. And he's going to compete for minutes at the same position as Sam Merrill. So when you start getting other guys back healthy, all of a sudden... A guy's place in the rotation is going to move further and further back. All of a sudden, a guy's place in the hierarchy is going to be less and less important. And look, this doesn't mean just because he played six minutes against the Clippers today, it doesn't mean that that that's all he's going to play in the Cavs' next game or the game after that. It's just the situation that he is in. He is a specialist. He is a change of pace type guy, and he is one of the last guys in this rotation. And when you're one of the last guys in the rotation, inconsistency comes when it comes to touches, when it comes to minutes, and when it comes to importance. That's just the way it is. And you mentioned a player, Chris, that received a lot of hate this season in Darius Garland, especially after playing pretty bad against the Phoenix Suns earlier this week, and then coming back and having 25 plus points in both the games against the Lakers and the Clippers, even with Donovan Mitchell being in the rotation against the Lakers on Saturday, I feel like he is starting to get back to where he's been in the past, like the earlier the season, before the injuries, and things of that nature. And I also think his confidence is starting to return, especially during this Clippers game. There were a lot of different times and periods where I saw him like celebrating and smiling. And we both know the importance for Darius Garland specifically when he is enjoying the game and having fun while playing it. There might not be a player on the Cavs that plays better when he is having a good time. And I think the only other person I could think of in that sense would be Jared Allen. But, I mean, what have you thought of Darius's last two performances, especially in today's game against the Clippers? His overall performance, in some ways, Ethan, was soured by three turnovers in the fourth quarter. And that's something that the Cavs are trying to get Darius to understand. And that's something that I think a lot of people have pointed to when it comes to Darius. There has to be a level of valuing every single possession. There has to be an understanding about how precious taking care of the basketball is, especially in late game situations. The Cavs did a great job through three quarters of limiting their turnovers. After committing 19 turnovers against the Lakers on Saturday, all of the players in the locker room immediately after that game talked about turnovers, pointed to how detrimental those were. When I was talking to a few coaches before the game against the Clippers earlier today, I asked them for some schematic keys to the game and just certain things that that they pinpointed going into the game against the Clippers that needed to be in their favor. And the first thing that every person said was turnovers. We can't allow the Clippers to get out in transition. We can't squander possessions. We need to get quality looks at the basket as frequently as possible. And the Cavs did that 
through three quarters, and then they had five turnovers in the fourth quarter. A fourth quarter in which they were outscored 34-20. to A fourth quarter in which Darius had three of those five turnovers. As good as he was at the beginning of the game, and other points in the fourth quarter hitting some big baskets for the Cavs, he scored nine points in the fourth quarter. It's hard to overlook just how costly and how untimely those turnovers were. And, and how much that played into the Cavs only scoring 20 points in the quarter, and how much that played into the Clippers being able to come from behind. Yeah, Chris, I think you're right. Darius Garland's turnovers in late-game situations has been a problem all season, and we've talked about that on multiple occasions on this podcast. But I think we can't take away from the good and the bad, so I think that's the main thing, is he cannot snowball something that has been going well because – he didn't have that many turnovers before that. He only had two turnovers for the rest of the game till he had those three in the fourth quarter. And I mean, the other thing that I've noticed with Darius is it feels like he's been taking the defensive end more seriously as of late. He has back-to-back games with five steals. I mean, that's not something we've seen from Darius this season. That's something that we've seen from Donovan with Darius and Evan Mobley were out and they got to put... Him and Max Struess and Isaac Okora and Dean Wade and Jared Allen together and had him in the passing lanes more so. It felt like Darius has taken on assignments better and has taken that side of the court more seriously. And just knowing that he has heard all of the things that people have said about him about being lazy and I think he's taking it to heart. At least on that side of the ball, I've definitely seen improvement in his game as of late. And the thing that I'll say, Ethan, is if if you're looking to blame somebody for this loss, because that's how it goes with fans, they're always looking to blame somebody rather than credit the other team or anything along those lines. This isn't the one to put on Darius, okay? The, The turnovers late in the game were certainly costly. He's got to learn from that. He's got to be better in those situations, but... In the second half overall, when the Cavs offense completely collapsed, the combination of Max Struess, Karis LeVert, and Evan Mobley, they had six total points. Six between three of them. They went two of 18 from the field. That's not enough support for Jared Allen and Darius Garland. And maybe part of the reason why Darius felt like he had to try and make those plays late in the game, when he had to push it, late in the game when he had to take it on himself as opposed to maybe trusting the offense is because Max, Karras, and Evan, terrible in the second half from an offensive standpoint. Like, how do you go from 80 points in the first half to 38 in the second half? You know, three of your other starters are essential no-shows. So Darius tried to carry the load offensively, and Jared Allen tried to carry the load offensively. They just didn't get enough support in the second half. So even though I think it's fair to criticize Darius for the untimely turnovers, and you have to point those out because you cannot tell the story of this collapse without those three late game turnovers. I just don't think this is the game that you point to and say, this is on Darius. There were other players that simply did not step up the way that they needed to in the second half or the way that they did in the first half. I agree. I mean, when we saw this Cavs team go for 40 points in back-to-back quarters, they were sharing the load. They were getting it to one another. They were hitting their shots. It was not just a one-man army. This team is at its best when they're playing together, moving the ball, getting everyone involved, and then hitting their shots. And that just simply wasn't the case in the second half. And you can't put that on one player, but you can say that other people needed to step up because... When those shots stop falling, how else are you going to make an impact on the game? And simply nobody else was able to do enough to get the job done against the Clippers. But Chris, I think we got to end this podcast just by looking at the standings and what's going on. Because like I said, it's a mess. And Boston at one, Milwaukee at two, 15 games behind Boston just for people that need to know how far the gap is between one and two. Then Orlando and New York are both a game back behind the Bucks, and the Cavs are then a half game behind Orlando and New York, so a game and a half behind the Bucks. 
The Cavs are also only a game ahead of the six-seeded Indiana Pacers, and the Philadelphia 76ers are a game behind the Indiana Pacers in the sixth seed. So that means that they are literally a game back from making it into making a playoff berth rather than having to make it into the playing game. And Miami is only a game and a half behind the Indiana Pacers. Yeah, but that was a big loss head-to-head for Miami today against Indiana. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was a big loss. It was a big loss. So, Chris, just to put it into proportions, there is a four-game difference between the second seed and the eighth seed in the Eastern Conference. So, with three games left, these games are critical to finding out where teams are going to finish up. But, Chris, like I said earlier, I changed my take to saying that the Miami Heat are the worst team that the Cavs could face in the Eastern Conference first round playoff series instead of the Knicks, who we've said all year. What is your take on that, especially with Julius Randle being out for the season, OG and Anobi still reintegrating, and Mitchell Robinson on the bench currently for the Knicks? No, it's the Knicks. It's still the Knicks. The Cavs do not match up well against the Knicks. They played them three times this season. I, I don't remember if they cracked the 100-point mark once. Some of their worst offensive performances have come against the Knicks, whether it's in a win or a loss. It's just a tough matchup. They play with a level of physicality. They play with a level of toughness. They play with a level of strength. And no, the Cavs have yet to crack the 100-point mark against the Knicks all season long. Defensively, they've got a really, really good scheme that bothers the Cavs, especially Darius and Donovan. They've got shooters. They've got depth. The Cavs have no answer for Jalen Brunson, not consistently anyway. That is a team that the Cavs should want nothing to do with in the first round of the playoffs. And for the Cavs, they have now, based on this slide at the end of March and the beginning of April, they have put themselves in a tenuous position where they are in danger of facing a team the caliber of the Knicks in the first round and having it be another early exit and an offseason filled with questions. Donovan Mitchell's future. Is J.B. Bickerstaff the right coach? Donovan and Darius together, do they have to break that up? Jared Allen, Evan Mobley together, do they have to break that up? That's the position that the Cavs have put themselves in. It is a very tenuous position. It's not a comfortable spot that they are in right now when it comes to the standings. I will say, though, that game against the Pacers, the second game that the Cavs play on this homestand to finish out the year, like that's big because the Cavs have three games left. The Pacers have three games left. And sandwiched between that for both teams, relatively easy matchups. The Pacers have Toronto. Toronto has been playing a little bit better recently, but we all know they stink. One of the worst teams in the Eastern Conference. And then Atlanta to finish out the season for Indiana. Who knows? The Hawks are so up and down. They've been up and down throughout the course of this year. That should be a game at home that the Pacers win. If you feel like the Pacers are going to beat Toronto and Atlanta, the game head-to-head between the two teams, it could go a long way in determining seeding between those two teams specifically. So that one is one that I think everybody should have circled. But to your broader point about the Cavs being fifth right now and in line as of right now for a first-round matchup against the Knicks, that is worst-case scenario for this team. The only thing that would be worse for them, I'm trying to even see if it's realistic. It doesn't feel as realistic anymore. Like the top two worst matchups to me for the Cavs in the first round are the Knicks and then Philly with Embiid back. Because Philly with Embiid back may be the second best team in the Eastern Conference. And having to play that group of of players in the first round is is not something that the Cavs should want either. Yeah, Chris, I mean... I'm going to stick with my take on the Heat and the Knicks being the two teams that I don't think the Cavs want to face, especially because we don't know the realisticness of them facing the 76ers. But I think all of these teams are not games that they would want to sign up for if they had the choice of a seven-game series. And I still think the Pacers are their favorite matchup for the first round. That's the thing. In this state, how does anybody look at any matchup potentially for the Cavs in the first round and say, okay, that's favorable for them? 
I don't think they do. Even the Pacers, and the Pacers have weaknesses, and we've discussed them many times on this podcast. But just the way that the Cavs are playing, the health of Donovan Mitchell, the questions surrounding the health of Dean Wade, the lack of confidence that it seems like this team has, the frustration that has built, the broken offense, the defense hasn't been great either. They're just like so many issues right now for the Cavs. It's so funny because when when I was talking to Donovan Mitchell and Max Struess in the locker room following the Lakers game, I said, how do you even pinpoint what to focus on down the stretch here? Because it feels like there are so many things going wrong for you guys. And Max Struess was like, it's everything. We got to focus on everything. And then I asked Donovan, I said, everything seems like a lot at this point in the season. <laughs> and it's just, the Cavs aren't in a really good place right now going into the postseason. It is the exact opposite of what they were hoping for at the beginning of the year when they said, we want to be playing our best going into the postseason. <laughs> we want to be on an upward trajectory. Yeah, that hasn't happened. It's low-key been the opposite. But yeah, Chris, we talk about the Indiana Pacers. We talk about their powerful offense, their ability to put up numbers, and the way the Cavs have been shooting the ball outside of the first half of today's game, it doesn't look like they're going to be able to keep up, much less stop them. So that's the other thing. But I think that's about everything to talk about for today, Chris. What do you think? Yep, I'm good with that. All righty. But until next time, that'll wrap up today's episode of the Wine and Gold Talk podcast. But remember to become a Cavs insider and interact with Chris and me by subscribing to Subtext. Sign up for a 14-day free trial or visit cleveland.com backslash Cavs and click on the blue bar at the top of the page. If you don't like it, that's fine. All you have to do is text the word STOP. It's easy, but we can tell you that the people who sign up Stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the Cavs from me and Chris. This isn't just our podcast. It's your podcast. And the only way to have your voice heard is through subtext. Y'all be safe. We out.